right, great. Well, it looks like we have everyone then. So I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's meeting of August 31st, 2023. Um, today we have uh, one substantive agenda item, and it's a presentation from the Vermont Federation of Nurses and Health Professionals. And um, their president, Deb Snell, will be presenting to the Care Board on the state of nursing in Vermont uh, from a nurse's perspective. Uh, this is an important discussion that I'm glad that we're going to be able to have. Um, the Care Board's had a number of presentations relating to other issues in Vermont, including primary care and cost shift issues and the like. And uh, I think we're overdue um, for directly hearing from uh, the nurses and uh, some of the issues that they're seeing and having. I mean, I think we all recognize that the nursing workforce issues are a huge challenge on the nurses for one, not having sufficient staff to, to do their jobs and the stress that goes with that, some significant workplace safety concerns. Um, and then on the other side of it, the challenges it puts on the hospitals and the financial system, having to rely on travelers and the amount of money that that has um, cost Vermont um, is very, very, very significant. So um, I'm really happy that we'll have a chance to hear and speak with um, some nurses today on some of these issues. And hopefully we'll have ideas and thoughts on how some of the challenges can be best addressed um, so that they abate a bit. Um, so thank you, Ms. Snell and, and others for being here, for uh, providing us that information. Um, before we turn to that, uh, I'm gonna turn to uh, Executive Director Barrett for her Executive Director's report. Uh, good afternoon, can you hear me, Chair Foster? Yes. Okay, so I will be brief. I wanted to remind folks um, about some public comment periods. We have an ongoing public comment period on a next potential all-payer model. So as I've um, stressed uh, in, in several meetings uh, over the last year or uh, year and a half, please send any comments regarding a next potential all-payer model with our um, federal go government partners to us. Um, and we also share all those comments with the governor's office and with our partners at AHS. That's number one. And in regard to public comment, um, the hospital budget public comment period ended yesterday, the official public comment period, but I think everyone knows, and I'll just say it out loud, that the Green Mountain Care Board takes public comments 365 days a year. So um, please know that anyone can submit uh, any other public comments on any of our regulatory or other work. Um, and we did close the official public comment period in order for the board to consider those comments uh, before they started deliberating. So uh, with that, that is all I have to announce at this point. And um, hopefully I can get back online shortly. Otherwise, I will be listening from the phone line. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and one other quick agenda item is uh, are the uh, minutes from August 2nd, um, 2023. Uh, I don't know, has everyone had a chance to review those? And if so, is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Second. Any board discussion? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And the motion carries and the minutes are approved. Um, with that, Ms. Snell, I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself and who's ever speaking and um, take it away. Thank you. Yes, as uh, usual, I'll be doing most of the speaking. So, and um, please call me Deb. Um, Miss Snell is just, I don't know, I don't answer to that normally. So, I am fine with Deb. Um, so, my name is Deb Snell. Um, I have been a nurse since 1999. I have always worked just at UVMMC. I have been in the medical ICU since 2001. Um, which you know we affectionately called COVID Central the last couple of years. I am an associate degree nurse that actually got my degree in New York. Um, I thought about getting my bachelor's, but the thought of going back to school at my age was just not something I was interested in. Um, I do want to start with a disclaimer, um, just that I am not a mathematician or a statistician. Um, I'm a nurse who frankly hated math when I was growing up. 
Um, but I've done my best to represent the data that I will be giving with you today. Um, my new best friend, Excel, has helped me with this. So, and this is not, this presentation is not meant to be a deterrent or interfere in any way with the hospital budget deliberations. This is a separate issue that I think, and I thank you for having me here to discuss this. It's something I am very passionate about in my role as president of the FNHP, but I am also president of the AFT Vermont Healthcare, representing about 5,500 nurses and healthcare workers across the state. So I feel pretty genuine when I say, even though I'm sharing this data with you, and a lot of it just does come from UVMMC, I think on smaller scales, hospitals across the state are seeing the same thing. Um, and the nurses that I hear from at Porter and our new members at CVMC have the same concerns and issues that we do. So thank you for having me here for this. Let me hopefully, Kristen, keep your fingers crossed that this will work. So again, um, I'm going to be mostly speaking about data from UVMMC. So I just wanted to share with you some uh, abbreviations that um, I'll be using in the presentation. Um, I think everyone knows what an RN and LPN is. Um, LNA, some places call them CNAs, um, they're licensed nursing assistant, and they are honestly the backbone of the nursing staff. We can't do our jobs without them. Um, MHT's mental health techs, they will often be in our psychiatric units or in the emergency department um, dealing with our psychiatric population. Um, CPSA is our clinical patient safety attendant. Um, we affectionately refer to them as our patient sitters. When you have a patient that is maybe like older and confused or um, coming down off of something and pulling at lines and trying to get out of bed. They're the ones that are sitting at the bedside so the nurse doesn't have to, um, to keep an eye on them. Um, FTE is a full-time employee, um, again, defined as at least 72 hours in a pay period, um, 72 to 80 hours at our hospital, and I believe across the network is considered a full-time employee with your full benefits. So, as of the end of July, um, we're not quite through the year yet. Um, this is the amount of openings that we have for full-time employees at the hospital I shared with us. Um, nursing, 28.4% vacancy rate. That has been like fluctuating during the pandemic and onward, obviously. I believe five years ago, maybe we had a 10% or even an 8% vacancy rate. Um, LPNs fairly high, our LNAs 39.1%. They are the hardest to keep at the bedside. A lot of times they are going on and they start as an LNA and they're in nursing school or going forward in another position. Um, medical assistants mostly work at clinical offices. And again, the CPSAs and MHTs I explained and nursing leadership was just like a number that we happen to have, so I wanted to share. So at the end of March, we this was our vacancy rate at that point. So I just wanted to like show you this number in particular because the difference between March and the end of July is that hopefully we will have a number of nurses applying because they finished school. So I would hope to see that number a little bit higher. I think in Vermont, part of the issue that I see is, for example, Castleton. Most of the nurses at Castleton go and work at Rutland Regional because that's where they train. That's great. VTC students, they end up all over the state because their campuses are all over the state. UVM in particular, a lot of their nurses do come work with us, but because so many of their students are from out of state, a lot of them go back home. So we don't see as much of an influx of nurses from UVM that we would probably like to see. 
the alarming thing on this slide for me was, again, the LNA that we've actually lost traction in getting more LNA at our facility. Um, for those that don't know who have ever been hospitalized, they're the one probably answering your call bell, bringing you the water, helping the nurses turn the patients, answering the doors, answering the phones. They, we, like I said, we could not do our work without them. Recruitment time. So this is the time to fill a position. And what this means is from the day the position was posted until the day someone actually accepts the position. So 170 days, that is fluctuated. Obviously, that seems like a high number. During the pandemic, the research I did shows that actual time to fill in most states is like around 105 days. So we're above average, obviously, not in a good way. But again, I think it's part of the uniqueness of Vermont and the economic, I don't want to call it instability, but that we have here in the housing shortage in our state as well. And again, some of these numbers are high. The CPSA is 354 days. I have no explanation on why those positions are so hard to fill. I don't know if it's pay. I don't know if it's the job itself, but um, I know they are actively working for them because we desperately need them in all departments. So, um, and I, I put this in here. So terminations um, doesn't mean that someone was fired. So this is just to like show you, yes, we've had a number of people that have started, but we've had almost as many leave. Terminations are people who voluntarily leave, whether they're moving out of state because of family, they've accepted another position. Um, very few of them have actually been fired. We get a list um, as part of our union of any nurses that are terminated, and there are not that many. So most of these people are leaving of their own free will. So over time, kind of like the bane of nursing existence. So when your unit is short staffed, whether it was short staffed from the beginning because A, you just don't have enough nurses, or B, whether someone's home sick or had to leave sick, a sick child, whatever, you get a phone call asking you to come to work. Now, one phone call, okay, fine. But when you get five, six, seven phone calls a day asking you to come to work, you're drained. You know that your colleagues are having a really horrible day and you want to help, but you need the away time, honestly. So all of these phone calls are just like pressure cookers. We had people posting on our Facebook page sometimes pictures of their phones with just the UVMC, 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 just all the phone calls that people are getting constantly to come in, um, especially our resource department. And I point to them because they work in so many different areas of the hospital that they can get called not only from the resource department, but from like five or six other units that maybe they could potentially work in. And the number, the, and the, what I want to say, I was, uh, when putting this stuff together, um, I was a little surprised by the numbers, um, mostly not in a good way, unfortunately, but in Mar just in March alone, nurses worked almost 12,000 hours of overtime in our hospital. The travel nurses that work in our hospital worked about 9,720 hours. The LPNs, 148 hours. And again, the LPNs mostly work in clinics. There's just a few LPNs that actually work in the inpatient setting. The LNAs, 4,357 hours. And overtime is not just time and a half. Actually, I think maybe except for the LNAs and the LPNs, I'm not 100% sure, but most of them actually come in. Their work is they're getting paid double time. 
Um, we had multiple variations that we've gone through over the last few years of whether it's incentive, which is two times your pay, or being on call two times your pay, or our special pay. Um, it's it's sad. It's a fact that that's what it takes to get people to come in to work on their days off or to work extra. So, um, yeah, the hot topic travelers. Um, so as of like the middle of this month, um, from the data we received from the hospital, we've got approximately 343 travelers that would potentially be in union positions. Um, 75 in technical professional jobs. So that's anywhere from a tech in the OR to a respiratory therapist to um, CSR, which is the central sterile reprocessing. 268 of them are RNs and LPNs. I believe only two of that number are LPNs. Um, and we know that there are other positions in the hospital that do employ travelers. Um, off the top of my head, I know phlebotomy does have travel staff as well. Um, that is the group that is currently in bargaining, so we don't have that kind of information just yet. So we do recognize that travel pay has gone down significantly um, in the last, especially the last year. Um, during the height of the pandemic, it was probably around $200 an hour. Um, a lot of times they were called crisis nurses that came in on short notice, would only work like you know, two to six weeks. But where we are now is, well, these are their pay rates. So for our technical professionals, um, there are a few that command up to $125 an hour. Um, looking at them, I think it was mostly respiratory therapists and maybe, um, an MRI um, or no, a nuclear, I think a nuclear technology um, technician as well. Um, the few LPNs are at 75 an hour. RNs range from 90 to 170 an hour. Um, I'm not sure why there is such a vary in pay, to be honest with you. Um, it's not based on degree or where they work that I could ascertain. Um, it's kind of all over the place. I mean, we have anything from a diploma nurse to um, some have a master's or mostly a bachelor's degree. Out of those um, staff, 103 and five of the tech travelers are working 96 hours in a two week pay period. So while yes, our numbers for um, travel staff has gone down significantly, if you add those numbers in, I think it would probably add like another like 20 people if they were just working a normal 72 to 80 hour work week. So in a two week pay period, um, the hospital unfortunately has to pay out about three million, just over three million dollars for travel pay. Um, in July, um, on our the reports that we get for our union dues and staff for a two week pay period was almost 8 million in an average two week pay period that the hospital's paying out. That includes um, regular pay and overtime, mind you. So this is a slide I found most disturbing, honestly. So our members, um, I think the slide actually speaks for itself. Our average member pay in a pay period, and this is before any deductions, anything. Um, and then compared to the 343 travelers, um, it's almost $5,000 more in a two week pay period that is paid out to our travelers. So when you average it out, so what I did is I took the number of travelers times their bill rate and came up with an average of 113.72 an hour for our travelers. For an RN3, and I was trying to be generous because an RN3 actually, um, there are more RN2s on a lower pay scale than RN3s, but I was trying to be nice and bumped it up a little bit on step 12, which for our union contract is the middle of our pay scale. We have 24 steps. So you picked step 12, 
Um, so their pay, including their benefits, is fifty-five seventeen an hour. So when you average it all out, there's a difference of fifty-eight fifty-five an hour between what is paid. Now, I am one hundred percent fully aware that the travelers do not take that kind of money home. Um, back in February of twenty-two. Um, Represent, well, Senator, then Representative Welch, there was an article in Time Magazine where he was disparaging not the travel nurses, but the travel nurse companies that were price gouging. And I was quoted in that article. And I fully understand that. And I hate to use the term necessary evil because some of these people are my friends now. But it is, it's a sad fact of life that it was, a, they were demanding pay that was crazy, but hospitals had no choice but to pay this kind of money out. Thank God it's improved now, but it's still a regular full-time staff member costs less than having a travel nurse in that position, period. So this is the... I keep saying these are alarming and they and they keep getting alarming. I apologize for that. I will try to end on a more positive note if possible. Um, but what bothers me the most about disinformation is that when you're a new nurse fresh out of school and maybe you want to get away from home and maybe you want to travel and you're looking for a place to go and you're researching, this is what they're seeing online. And that's what's alarming to me. So in nursejournal.org um, in February of this year, our overall ranking, just in general, not even pay, was 49th out of 51 states. Um, in Becker's Hospital Review in May of this year, we ranked 46 for salary adjusted for cost of living. And in wallethub.org, also published in May of this year, Vermont ranked 42nd overall, but fifth in the most job nurse job openings per capita, and we ranked 48th for nursing salary adjusted for cost of living. So if you're a young nurse starting out with the heavy student loan debt, unless you have rich parents, that's what you're looking at when you're looking for a place for a job. Um, and the one thing I will note back into in the wallet hub, um, in the wallet hub, dot org back in 2018 and 2019 um our bottom fifth ranking for job openings and salary was the same so unfortunately it just has we've not been able to really make any headway so we know we just can't look at salaries if we look at just salaries we're probably one of the latest ones I saw was we ranked like 20, anywhere from like right in the middle. We're right in the median, 25th, 26th. But it's obviously, I mean, this is no secret, the high cost of living in our state, the impossible housing market. Um, I can't tell you how many travelers that I've worked with that actually most of the travelers that come here, they love it here. They love our state. They love the people that they work with. We become friends with these people. They want to stay. They can't afford it. They can't afford it. And that's sad. Um, we've had travelers that have had to cancel their contracts because they couldn't find housing. And I think there was even physicians hired in. There was a traveler who told me that he had to leave the facility because his Airbnb fell through and he was sleeping in his car. So it's just, unfortunately, that's how things are in our state right now. Um, so I did want to to share this, and I don't want to get union heavy here at all. But um, when I know when UVMMC, at least in this time period, when they were looking at like the cost of living adjustments that we were asking for. So first of all, we weren't trying to compare ourselves to Boston. We were trying to compare ourselves to Plattsburgh across the lake because at that point in time, they were making more than we were with a lower cost of living. And I'm pointing like you can see me. I'm sorry. <laughs> so it's um, so I did some research and in my role with AFT, I've been lucky to make contacts with um, other local presidents around the country 
and I found Portland, Oregon, which I found very interesting. So there's a 576-bed academic medical center. They're working on expanding, the same as UVMMC. And what our hospital focused on at that time for cost of living was a cost of a two-bedroom apartment in Burlington or in Chittenden County, period. And here in Oregon, we see anywhere from a high, a median of 1,950 down to like 1,700. In our state, and I use the same, I searched around, took a couple of comparators, is anywhere from 2,150 to 1,872. So that's several hundred dollars difference in an average two bedroom apartment cost. However, the nurses at that hospital, they start a brand new nurse day one is making forty two seventy five an hour compared to our thirty six zero four an hour. So it's twelve thousand a year pay difference for similar, if not better, um, cost of living rates. So um, there's a lot on this slide, and I'm not entirely comfortable. Um, giving you a lot of information other than what's on here. This is yeah, a work right. in progress that's happening right now. Pardon? I, oh. I think someone just had a hot mic. Yeah, okay. Um, so um, the network um, recently hired this company, BDO, which I had to look them up. It's been uh, I did get it somewhere. Uh, Binder Olek and Ott, I believe it's the fifth largest. Um, sorry, moment. It is the fifth largest accounting network in the world. Um, they do have a healthcare section and they have come into our facility recently. I think Dr. Epen might have been the one to bring them into our network um, to look at the way that our volumes and our some of our staff. Um, well, this is supposed to be about high value care. Um, some of our staff lovingly refer to it as high volume care. What it's doing or what it's looking to do, and it hasn't 100% rolled out yet, is to shorten patient visit times to 15 minutes. Um, this is right now, from what I understand, mostly in just our primary care areas. What is driving me crazy about this is how is this putting our patients first? Instead of working on recruiting more APRNs, encouraging more people to go back to school for APRNs, paying for APRN education, recruiting more primary care physicians to our state, which we all know we desperately need. The answer is not to shorten patient visit times to the point where the providers are feeling uncomfortable and not feeling like their patients are getting any real information out of their meetings. Um, and this is not just the APRNs, it is from what I understand, um, medical, uh, the physicians as well. Again, this is still a work in progress, but we are very concerned and are going to be keeping a close eye on this rollout. And um, for this next slide, um, is Tracy Pornazier on this call? No. Okay. This is an example. Um, so in our outpatient clinics, um, the nurses have what they call an in-basket, and it's work that needs to be done that day on top of like anything else that may be occurring that day. And I admit it, I am not an outpatient nurse. Um, I'm starting to learn a lot more about how they work and I will also admit this is an extreme example, but it is a scary example. So the 
our, the RX requests are people that are calling in to get their prescriptions refilled or asking for a new prescription. Um, new calls, those are supposed to be answered within 24 to 48 hours. The patient advice requests, um, those again, those are mostly through that new system called MyChart where people are sending in questions and want a response from the provider. The referral messages are patients that have been referred to like a specialty clinic, but something's missing, like they needed an x-ray or something that hasn't been done yet. So they're calling the office back to get that done before they can even set up an appointment. And the prior offs are usually medication related. I believe mostly come from our pharmacy. Um, and it's usually dealing with an insurance issue. Now, you have four to five nurses trying to get uh, come in starting the day, and this is what they see that they have to try to tackle on a day. And it's just not possible. It is not possible for them to get through all of that work and get back to the patients in a timely manner. Um, jokingly, this particular clinic actually had um, their nurses come in on a Saturday for four hours to just try to work on getting down the basket to an acceptable level. Um, apparently in most clinics they might see about a third of this this is a specialty clinic that more and more patients are needing the service of and these nurses are drowning so i kind of talked about this a little bit in the beginning um that i feel we're behind the ball and I sent, um, Chair Foster, I sent you a survey that was um, recently put out by the AMN talking um, about staffing and nursing. And their survey, um, and I'll quote, has consistently warned that the combination of growing nurse shortages due to increasing retirements of baby boomer nurses, a dearth in education and training for the replacements, and the rising utilization of healthcare services by a rapidly aging population would eventually lead to workforce related healthcare crisis. We call it a perfect storm of approaching causes and circumstances. And then COVID happened. So we knew before COVID, nurses knew before COVID that we were looking at a shortage. So I, it bothers me that they're now talking about it like they knew about it all along so why wasn't anything done when we went out on strike in 2018 the one issue we kept repeating at the table is we need this money not even for ourselves but to get people here and keep people here i've been a nurse there for 24 years i make decent money i know that if I lived somewhere else, if I lived in upstate New York, I'd be living like a queen on what I make, but not here in Vermont. And we recognize that. And we know that, you know, we, the hospital and other hospitals will often say, well, it's not all about money, but unfortunately, sometimes it is. And getting people here so they can afford to stay and live here, unfortunately, it, it truly is. Um, as an example, um, and I know Dr. Leffler is on this call, so he'll probably um, not be particularly thrilled with this slide, but um, our members recognized fairly early in the pandemic that we were in trouble. We saw how many travel nurses were coming in. More importantly, we saw how many colleagues were leaving. and. Not as scenarily, I mean, some were leaving because honestly, they were afraid of COVID. I get that. I was in the thick of it. I understand how horrible and scary it was at that, especially at the beginning. But they were also leaving for opportunities when travel nursing were offering, you know, at that point in time, eight, ten thousand dollars a week in New York City. You know, if I didn't have a family or obligations or my role here, I might have thought about doing it. Um, but they were leaving and we knew that we needed to try to, you know, put a plug in it. So we approached the administration um, 
and said, would you consider it? And Dr. Leffler said, yes, we would consider it, but don't even talk about double digits. I understood that when I brought it to my members um, and I see Chris Gagno on the call, um, he can attest to the fact that we worked really hard to get people even down to 10% because they were so angry. So we approached him, but the 10%, it was flat. No, won't even talk about it. Fine. A few months later, the hospital actually asked to meet with us to discuss a wage reopener. Um, we put together a bargaining team um, and the hospital came back to us and they were basically offering the same 10% that we had asked for five months, six months before that. And unfortunately, the terms they put on their proposal of 10% were unacceptable to us. Um, meaning that they wanted us to not have to negotiate until 2025. Um, there were just things that we found unacceptable, so we turned down their offer. A few months later, they came back to us and just said, 10% across the board for everyone with 5% in October 2022 and this coming October 2023. Um, so we we accepted it and the condition was when we went back to the bargaining table, which we did last year, wages were not discussed, but we were able to open up other articles that we felt were vitally important. So the question is, they obviously knew it was the right thing to do. So what took so long to do the right thing? So um, in light of this presentation, um, I asked our secretary and she magically was able to put together a quick survey and get it out to our members for me. Um, and I just, I just wanted to know how people were feeling and what they were thinking. And I believe I haven't updated this. There have been more responses since then. Um, nurses are notoriously late at looking at their emails, but um, 39 out of the 258 that responded were planning on leaving UVMC before the end of the year. 37 plan to change jobs within the organizations. Um, the biggest factors playing into this were salary and benefits, um, workplace violence, which we know is a huge issue at our hospital. Um, 77 responded um, family. Um, like moving better opportunity and 29 responded better opportunities and 120 responded uh, work life balance, which we know um, many of our members are lacking right now. Um, some of the comments that were made. So administration making money led decisions without a clinical lens. I depend on my support staff. Um, and they are not currently paid enough to reflect the value to our team. RN should be paid more as well. I support my family and we've never been able to afford daycare and live paycheck to paycheck. Um, lack of support from management, being asked to do more with less, not enough CTO, which is our vacation time, um, the dreaded parking, and um, travelers that are not invested in our community. So, um, CTO has always been um, something that we have tried to bargain over parking. Um, I think Dr. Leffler and I will agree on this is just not a problem we can solve right now, unfortunately. Um, but the living paycheck to paycheck and most nurses that I talk to are the breadwinners in their family. Um, and it's sad that so many people I talk to are living paycheck to paycheck and can't afford daycare, or most of their check is going toward daycare in our state. Um, the comments, what they love about UVNMC, their colleagues, their patients, being well-staffed. They love that we have safe staffing patient ratios, their patients, their coworkers. And I love them making a positive difference in my patient's day. So the nurses there, we, love where we work. We love what we do. We love taking care of our patients. We just need the tools to do it better and safer. So that is the last of my presentation. Thank you for that. Um, thank you. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I'm going to turn it to board member questions and comments. I, I had a couple real quick, if you don't mind. Um, no. Would you put the slides back up for a second? I think it was slide 20 or 21, 20, I think. It had the survey results, the number leaving or thinking of leaving or? Um, yes, it was, I had it in front of me. Um, 39 out of 258 were planning to leave our institution before the end of the year. And then 37 out of 257 were planning to change jobs within the organization. Um, oh, and then you. underneath it, it says factors playing into the decision, but then these numbers, like 113, but there's only 39 I, thinking thinking of leaving. Yeah, so um, they, um, I maybe the way the question was worded, um, and I think just because I left it at the end of the year, there were some in the comments that said, not before the end of the year, but in the next two years. So I think that's probably why. Okay. All right, um, that makes sense. Do hospitals typically run these kinds of, and you might not be the right person to ask, but do hospitals run these kinds of surveys so they sort of have a finger on the pulse of what's going on with the workforce? They do. Um, they usually run them annually. Um, and if someone on the call can remember the name of the survey, um, it is like a nursing satisfaction survey where it does really delve deep into your relationship with your coworkers, with your manager, with physicians, even with case managers and dietary. So they do do that survey. Um, we're waiting for actually for some of the most recent results to, to come out. And have those been run? One of your slides said that it was reactive, some of the negotiation and changes that were, were happening because of the pandemic. Have those types of surveys been run, you know, historically consistently, or is that a new thing? Um, no, they have been run. Um, I know um, immediately, like after we went out on strike, um, the hospital, I think, was really like caught off guard and ended up doing a survey. They brought someone in. And it was like not the entire staff, but randomly throughout the hospital from like multiple different departments talking about their feelings about working UVMMC and the issues and stuff. And at that point in time, I think they were caught off guard about how unhappy their staff was. Um, and they toured all the facilities. They, they did openly share all the results from it with everybody. And I applaud them for that because that did not have to be an easy thing to do. Um, the unfortunate thing is I don't feel like a lot of it has really changed. Um, we may see our managers more. I know Dr. Leffler and um, Peg Gagne, our chief nursing officer, do make a point to try to go out and round and just say hello to people. So at least they're seen, but on the ground level, we're just not seeing the, the changes that we need to see to to keep people here. Okay. Then you said that on salary alone, um, Vermont was at median, and I presume you mean for all of Vermont, not just the hospital, you not just the UVM Medical Center, but all of Vermont? Um, that's actually nationally. Vermont ranks 26 nationally. Right, the state, the state of Vermont ranks 26 yes, nationally. Yeah, yes, actually, yes, absolutely. It's across the state, which tells you that it's not just UVMMC. It is a state problem. Right, okay. And then my last question is, do you have that national ranking of uh, nurse salaries over time? And what I'm trying to understand is, is that something that we've mm. moved up on at, during the pandemic and we were historically lagging or have we kind of always been sort of in the middle? Um, for salaries, since I've really been paying attention to them, we've always been right around, like just on salaries around the median. Okay. And I would um, welcome any of my colleagues to speak up to answer as well if they think I'm not quite correct. 
And then the strike, I was living here and I remember reading about it a, a good amount, but my memory's fuzzy. How long did the strike last? It was only a two day strike. It was the first strike that we had had at UVMC. Um, and um, as an officer in our union at the time, we really didn't know what to expect. Um, we had never done it before. So when our members voted to go on strike, we initially agreed that it would be a two day strike. Um, there was a possibility that we were going to go out again for longer, but we decided that we we're going to try to do our best to avoid that and stay at the bargaining table. Those are the only questions I had, um, but thank you for presenting to us. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll open it up to the other board members for any comments or questions they may have. I had a, a couple of questions. One is um, to, and you may not again be the right person, Deb. So my apologies, mm -hmm. and just if no this problem. isn't isn't the right question, I'm asking you a question that isn't appropriate for you. Um, I'm wondering how it works um, a little bit on the traveler for the traveling nurse. So you mm -hmm. had said, you know, obviously the contracted amounts with the company are not all paid directly to the nurse. Do they mm -hmm. have things like health insurance benefits from that company? Are they expected to buy that separately? How does that part work? So I think every company might operate a little bit differently, um, sure. but most of them do have um, a health insurance. Some of them do have retirement. Part of that money um, they do get to pay for their housing, and that's like a huge deal because they can get anywhere from like $600 to $1,000 mm -hmm. a week for housing, that is not taxable. So I that's see. a big deal as well. So they get some in their wages, but the rest of the company obviously gets a pretty good chunk of that as well. Got it. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Um, and then the other question I had is, um, so every five years we get a new workforce a strategic plan from the Agency of Human Services, who is in charge mm -hmm. of um, kind of pulling together uh, this kind of strategic plan. Um, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that's something that you've or your union has ever been involved in, if that's something that might make sense to try and engage in so that um, your perspective can be brought into that strategic thinking from the, the administration at the state's perspective mm -hmm. in terms of planning. Um, at least from what the state is able to help or provide with. Yeah, I'm aware of um, a lot of those um, meetings that are happening. Back a few years back, I was at a really large meeting um, that Senator Sanders had actually put together, and the governor was there. I think a couple of members, um, I think Kevin Mullen was there. Um, yeah. And not that it was a problem, but most of that group was made up of the college educators, which I, I understand yeah. they play a huge role in that. Um, they are the ones providing the nurses, hopefully, to our state. But there wasn't, and I, I would always laugh because whenever I'm invited to those meetings, I always find I'm the only like labor person in the room. And the, a lot of times the only actually full-time working nurse at the bedside. Um, and I really think that we do have a voice that needs to be heard in these types of meetings, but we're kind of shut out from them, honestly. Thank you. Uh, those were those were my curiosities. Thanks for your presentation. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Robin. Um, hi, Deb. Uh, Dave Merman. Uh, thanks for your Hello. presentation today. Um, mm -hmm. The, one question and then a comment. Um, you mentioned some so nursing vacancy rates. Do, do you have mm -hmm. benchmarks for nursing vacancy rates uh, among peer group hospitals? Um, I do not. Um, okay. Just on a national, I mean, it's, it's difficult. There are some states who are apparently doing it right that are not seeing the shortages that the rest of the country is. Um, that's part of my job right now is I ramp up actually our nurse bargaining next year and to really be looking at those numbers. 
Um, in fact, doing this presentation, I felt like I was getting ready to prepare for that. Um, but nationally, I don't know if they're as high as like a Vermont Academic Medical Center. I don't know that. Um, just listening to colleagues, they often have really high vacancy rates, especially in um, Connecticut and Washington. Um, my friends there tell me that, but I don't have an, an actual number I can share with you at this point. If I get it, I will certainly send pass it on. That's that'd be great. Thanks. And my, my comment is, I, I I don't know if you know, but I'm an emergency physician, and I think you know, as a when I was a medical student, mm -hmm. one of the things that was just most enticing about the emergency department is you get to work in this great multi, you know, multi professional team with nurses, EMTs, mm -hmm. techs, RADS techs, respiratory therapists, and. And much of what you say uh, today resonates with many of the stories that I've heard over the last 20, 20 years. Uh, one of them that is almost most striking to me is being out for a mountain bike ride with nurse friends at, who work at multiple different hospitals and just getting mm -hmm. hammer called to come in. And it's yeah. it's it, it has a big a drain of guilt, I think, on people who say, yeah. no, I'm going to go for a mountain bike ride today instead of instead of go in, but mm -hmm. thank you so much for your, thanks so much for your presentation and coming today. Thank you. I don't actually have any questions or comments other than thank you for coming and uh, sharing your yeah. thoughts with us today. Yeah, and I thank you so much for having me and listening to this. Um, like I said, this is not supposed to be, even though the only data I could really share was from my hospital, I truly believe that this is, like I said, on a smaller scale across the state and what is happening. Um, I know it's happening nationally, but I think Vermont, we're a little unique, especially with our housing market playing such a huge role in this. Um, but I'm again, thank you for having me. And if you would like me back for any clarifications, please just let me know. And I'm happy to give you any updates, especially positive ones if they happen along the way. Great. Um, I'm not sure if the healthcare advocate has any questions or comments. No, I'll just turn on to turn on my camera and my sound to say thank you and uh, thank you, Deb. Personally, you've been at this for a long time, and, yeah. uh, and and thanks, board, for taking the time to listen to this. All right, and um, I'll open up to any public comment we may have via the raise your hand function. I'll call people in the order their hands are raised. All right, I don't see any, so um, I think we can move I'm on. I'm fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes there's a lot and sometimes there's not. Um, well, thank you, Ms. Snell, for putting this together and educating us a little bit further. Um, we appreciate all that you do and all the nurses do for our health system, and, and thank you for, for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And um, I'll turn to whether or not we have any old business or new business to come before the board. And is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. And all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And we are adjourned. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.